Hello, my name is Katherine McLean, and this is my RSLA video interview. The first question is there are many career opportunities available to you. Why do you want to lead others in a school? When I started my Teach for America journey, I had no idea where it was going to take me. But once I learned about educational inequity, and after considering some of my educational experiences, I knew that I had to make the most impact in the quickest way. So I joined Teach for America, was placed in Teach for America Appalachia, and I work every day for my students to ensure that they don't face the educational inequity that they have in the past. I know that the best way to get involved in educational inequity is to join Teach for America and get involved in the classroom. So I have done that. And in doing that, I still consider my students and the best way to support them as they continue their journey throughout school. And now I think that the best way to support them is by leading the group of people that are leading them or supporting those on the front lines of educational inequity in the teachers in the building. Some of the leadership positions I have had at our school has helped me see different perspectives, but I haven't forgotten the student perspective. And that's what I feel is forgotten a lot in school districts. People are concerned about tenure and about the curriculum and about everything but our top priority. And that's our students and then growing them into the citizens that they can be, that they want to be. So I want to be a leader in a school because I want to put students first. I do in my classroom. I'd like to think that I'm 100% student driven, even though sometimes I do have to lecture some about poetry, transcendentalism, and the great Gatsby, but that's okay. But always first and foremost in my mind are my students. And that's why I want to be a leader in my school so that my students come first and not anything else. The second question is you could learn to be a leader in a school anywhere. Why do you have a particular passion to lead in a rural area? Well, I'm from a rural area, a very small town called Ripley, Ohio, um, where we were so far out that some of our sports competitions weren't actually in other states. Now I work and live in Inez, Kentucky, which reminds me a lot of home in the size of school. And I tend to go out of state here as well for sporting competitions, basketball in particular. Um, so I am from a rural region and I was placed in a rural region and I plan to work and live in a rural region. The big city does have its calling. As a public relations major in college, I thought I was gonna end up in a big city. And here I am in a rural region. It's comfortable, it's home, but it has its unique assets. The people you find in small towns, you don't find a lot in rural communities. My first weekend in Inez, Kentucky, I was invited to three churches and two family reunions, even though I'm not related. And that's a great thing about rural communities is they welcome you. There's a family feel. There's also great histories in small towns. Uh, the small town I'm living in now is very different than the one I grew up in history-wise. However, there are some similarities and those folks that are prideful of where they come from and some of the folklore that you hear and especially some of the ho southern hospitality that I've experienced are unique assets to small towns. Rural regions also have their unique issues, such as issues in transportation, road management, lack of government services, lack of transportation, and of course rural poverty. Something that I did experience when I was growing up, especially in my school district, which is considered um, a, an underprivileged school. However, I now know that there are ways to change the stigma of rural poverty and there are ways to help improve the region and that's through working with the students that I work with today. Um, just like I tell my students, the best way to revitalize your community is to use your greatest asset. And most of the time in these rural regions, particularly in Inez, Kentucky and in Ripley, Ohio, our greatest asset are the people who are there. So ideally, I would like to go back to Ripley, Ohio, and I would like to be a school leader in the school that I graduated from. I feel like if I'm not willing to go back to where I came from, then I'm not preaching a message that is entirely true. I encourage my students to go to college, to gain knowledge, to get the experience that they need, and then come back to Inez, Kentucky, and revitalize the community in the way that they know how. And the way that I know how is to be a school leader, so I'm going to do that in a rural region where I grew up. Now, I may never work in the high school that I graduated from, and I may just be a school leader in Kentucky instead of Ohio, but I feel like that's making a difference too. I feel like I need to experience the own message that I'm preaching because I believe in it. Otherwise, I wouldn't preach it. So that's why I want to stay in a rural region is because I'm from there. I live there. I know the unique assets and issues, and I'm taking my own word. 
is how to revitalize the communities that need the help, that deserve the educational equity that we keep talking about. I want to be one of those people who changes the community that I'm from. The third question asks about the words people I know would use to describe me. Now, I'm sure you have plenty of words of your own now that you've seen this video, um, but I did come up with some words that people would use, I hope, to describe some of the interactions they have with me. My principal, Dr. Laney, would probably describe me as inquisitive. I ask lots of questions in meetings, in staff meetings, in department head meetings, etc. And a lot of these questions come from the student perspective. For example, we are now a PBIS school, which means we're focused on positive behavior and rewards and interventions for not positive behavior. So I ask a lot of questions from the student's perspective. For example, um, how are the students going to get this information from the teacher? Which teacher will tell them? What period of the class is that? How do we work a schedule where every student gets the same amount of time in each course? What can I do to help the scheduling needs of my freshmen who are going to be sophomores and have to choose classes? Sometimes my questions are good ones, and sometimes they're because I'm a second year teacher. But I feel like if I don't ask these questions, then maybe someone won't think of the answer, if that makes sense. So, for example, we were trying to put in a reward system for these students who have given their input on this new PBIS support team. And my first question was, what do the students earn? Or what did the students get? Or how are we supposed to explain this so the students get it? I mentioned before that I really enjoy having a student-driven classroom, and I feel like I'm a student-driven person. Getting up every day for my students means that I ask questions on behalf of them. Good questions and bad questions, but a lot of questions. And I feel like once my leadership team knows the answers to those questions and can answer me, then they can answer a student as well. So I'm always thinking about the student perspective, even if it just seems like I'm an inquisitive person who likes to know a lot of things. Um, the second a person that would describe me is the janitor. I'm, I think that Jamie would describe me as dedicated. I see a lot of Jamie at very strange hours of the day. I try to do my best to have a good work-life balance. So some days I leave the school just after the students and I come back about 8 o'clock in order to get my work finished. Other days I stay long into the night. I'll be there, uh, get at school about 7 o'clock and I'll leave at 7 o'clock. It just depends on the day. There are also days when I leave with the students and don't come back until the morning. So he sees me at very strange hours, sometimes in professional attire, sometimes in jogging pants, and sometimes in blue jeans. It just depends. Um, but he knows that I'm always available to um, have that little chat when he's sleeping in my room, and he knows I'm always available for my students. I'm sure when I offered tutoring the third day of school, my students thought I was kidding. But when they showed up the, the second week of school to actually have tutoring, I think Jamie understood that I'm a dedicated and uh, are really there for my students. The next uh, group of people are colleagues, and I think they would describe me as student-centered, mostly because I tend to ask a lot of inquisitive questions based on the students, um, but also because I'm very honest. And if there is a group of students who are causing some trouble or there's a group of students that need rewarded, I'm always talking about those students. So if students are involved at all, I want to know what you're talking about, especially if a student is struggling and needs some help or if a student is re doing really well and I need to call a parent or I need to do something to reward that person. I'm always talking about students and what we can do to better them and to help them. So I would like to think that they call me student-centered. Um, so I think putting together students that are dedicated and inquisitive are great words to describe a working professional. My students, on the other hand, would probably describe me as enthusiastic. I am very excited about teaching English language arts in the 10th grade. Now, am I very excited about the content of English language arts? Not necessarily, but don't tell my students because if I'm excited about it, they're gonna be excited about it and I know that trick. So even when we're talking about alliterations in poetry, I get very excited and some of my lessons are a little kooky and that's okay because I know once I get excited about it, they will too. Um, I also get excited about their growth and achievements. I shout out students a lot, particularly in public and particularly in print. So I'm changing my door a lot. Right now it says snowflake shout outs for students that grew over the uh, first semester in their reading level. Now this can be embarrassing, particularly to a student who's not used to achieving or who's really shy. But they know that I'm crazy about what I do and that I'm crazy about them. And if they just think I'm crazy, that's okay. I think another word for that is enthusiastic. So that's what I'm going with. So if there are people at my school who describe me as inquisitive and dedicated and student-centered and enthusiastic or a little bit crazy, I like to think of that as passionate. 
Now, when I looked at question number three in this interview, and I thought of the word passionate, I thought everyone's going to say passionate. So I don't want you to think that I'm passionate about teaching English language arts at Shadon Clark High School in 10th grade. I do. I enjoy what I do very much. But I'm passionate about my students and about making change for them and helping them in their trajectory to life. So yes, I'm passionate about what I do, and it shows in a lot of ways. But I'm also passionate about my students and them coming first. And that's why I want to take on a leadership role. It's because I'm a passionate person about changing their trajectory and making sure that they have an equitable education and can reach the goals that they have set for themselves. Not because I love English and not because I love rural regions, because I do. I love both. But because I'm passionate about students. Thank you for your time and I appreciate you viewing this video.